All right, folks, welcome back. Thanks for joining us here towards the end of our winter speaker series. I'm going to turn things over here to Ginny Broadhurst, who's the director of the Salish Sea Institute, to introduce our speaker, Tina Whitman, today. Uh, before that, thank you to the Salish Sea Institute, the Alumni Association, and the Environmental Science Department for supporting our talks. Great. Thanks so much, Xander. Um, well, as mentioned, you know, we kind of merged forces here to help um, have a Salish Sea focus to the Winter Quarter Speaker Series. I'm delighted to introduce Tina Whitman. Tina is the science director at Friends of the San Juans. You may be familiar with the organization, does great work out in, this, in San Juan County uh, in the archipelago. I have worked with Tina, known her for probably over 20 years, the time that she's been at Friends. She's got a wealth of knowledge she's gonna share with you. So here you go. Thanks for being here, Tina. Great, thanks, Jenny. Do you want help with it? Yeah. Let's just get that clipped on. Sorry. Oh, it's all the great. You got it too. All righty. Thanks, everybody, and welcome. Um, as Jenny said, I'm Tina Whitman. I'm science director at Friends of the San Juans, um, where I lead shoreline habitat restoration, research, and protection projects. Um, and today we're going to talk about shoreline restoration in the San Juans. Um, that's going to be kind of the, the end of what we talk about. There's a lot of things that go into getting us to restoration. So we'll go on a little journey and end with restoration. Um, so just quickly, what we'll go over today, I'll do a quick introduction to the organization. We'll talk about marine shorelines in the San Juans and also talk about the role of restoration in marine ecosystem recovery. Um, and before I do a little bit of the Friends of the San Juans, I'll tell you a little bit about me. I know when these are student classes, people are always interested in people's career paths. Um, I actually have an undergraduate degree in architecture. I realized about three quarters of the way through that program that I didn't want to be an architect, but it was not in the College of Arts and Sciences, so it would have taken me two extra years. So I got that degree, um, went out and worked for a couple years at wildlife refuges um, and land trusts, um, doing shorebird work and, and coastal work and then um, did, ended up at University of Oregon um, for my Master of Science in Environmental Studies. Um, so that's kind of my background. I'm an island person. I grew up on an island in New England. Um, I now live on Orcas Island um, with my family. Um, and I am fortunate enough to have worked with Friends of the San Juans for the last two decades. Um, it is a great organization, um, really at the intersection kind of of my interests of science and policy. Um, island communities are a passion of mine. Um, and we have three main program areas at Friends of the San Juans, Healthy Salish Sea, Natural Shorelines, and Thriving Communities. Um, we've been around for 45 years, um, a group of forward-thinking islanders. Um, back in 1979, we formed actually to help San Juan County do its first land use planning, actually have zoning, have minimum lot sizes, have different rules to protect ag and shoreline and forestry. Um, so Friends was really formed um, as really a land use group. Um, but when you think about land in the San Juan Islands, when you look at this picture, we're actually two thirds water, one third land, um, and an awful lot of shorelines. So that's what we're gonna talk about, focus on today. Um, so I like this little map just because it really reminds us, right? We think about the San Juans and this little county and there's less than 20,000 people. Um, but we have more shoreline um, than any other county in the lower 48 in the U.S. And if you stretched our shorelines out, it would go from Vancouver all the way to Eugene. So just to get a sense of like that scope of marine shoreline kind of packed into this little county um, in the heart of the Salish Sea is really an big part of why the San Juans are so important ecologically for the San Juans, but also for the larger Salish Sea region. Um, and you all know where we are on this map, but sometimes I do presentations that are much further away, but just getting a sense, you can again really see right there at the heart of the Salish Sea. Um, because we have so many islands, um, there's very diverse geology there, um, that leads to diverse habitat types. So we have high ecological values, Again, local and regional ecosystem services, and we'll get into what some of those are. Um, there's also about 5,000 waterfront parcels. So when you think about restoration, we're talking about working with a lot of different people. Um, and then we've got a lot of the sort of culturally and ecologically 
um, and sort of regionally significant species that we're all familiar with, right? We've got our southern resident killer whale, Chinook salmon, other species of salmon, um, seabirds, rockfish, um, and many of these species are actually at risk or endangered. Um, the San Juans also, of course, have an extensive and rich history of tribal presence, management, and use um, by multiple tribes, um, and that continues today. So just before we kind of really dive in, I'd like to just talk a little bit about sort of what is the marine near shore? What am I talking about when sort of say that word shoreline, right? Um, people always say, are you a marine biologist? And and really I'm working at that intersection of land and sea and it is really both, right? There's ocean influences, but there's also the terrestrial influences. So if you think about the marine shore, it's everywhere from, you know, if there's a tree that's 200 feet tall, 200 feet back that will end up on the beach or impacting that system, you know, it's back in that far in the riparian zone. Um, if we have a stream, you know, it goes up to the extent of tidal influence, obviously including the beach itself, right? We focus on beaches a lot, um, but that includes sort of the log line, the lower intertidal, um, out to the depth of what we call the photic zone, which is just the, where there's enough light where eelgrasses and kelps can grow. Um, and so this is a whole system here, right? It's not just one thing. Um, it's the biological processes, it's the physical processes. You have sediment supply, you have detritus, you have um, you know, all the different species, plants, animals, um, and then again, the physical processes that underlie that. And then we're gonna do just a little kind of slideshow thinking about what are, getting a little look of what are some of these species. Um, so we're more familiar with bull kelp, that's our canopy kelp that you can see from the surface. There's many other species of kelp that are understory kelp, provides habitat, um, great source of carbon for the deep ocean environment, um, and also helps attenuate wave energy. Um, it grows on rocks. If you're in a boat, don't go blasting through the kelp because there are rocks down there. And then eelgrass habitat, conversely, is not in our rocky shores, it's in our soft shores um, and our sediment shores. Um, eelgrass is also important as nursery habitat for a whole host of fish and shellfish. Um, and this picture, our Pacific herring, which spawn on eelgrass. Um, our shorelines are also salmon highways. So when we think about, we don't have big spawning rivers in the San Juans, right? There's one little stream that has a small population of coho salmon, but we have salmon in the San Juans and we've got the baby salmon. So this time of year, all those fish that are leaving their natal streams and making their way to the Pacific Ocean, they're spending time basically March through September um, in the shorelines of the San Juans, real close to shore. Um, so this map and graphic are showing um, basically juvenile salmon, so we're talking about the babies, and this is just Chinook. Um, this is based on some NOAA and Skagit River Systems Cooperative data. They did beach seine, so it's really shallow, right? You're in chest waders, so you're very close to shore. They sampled twice a month at 84 sites in the San Juans, and then there's genetics um, done on the Chinook salmon. So these different colors are all the different watersheds that the salmon are coming from that were captured. This is all fish that were captured in the San Juans in the shoreline habitat. So colors are the different watersheds of where they came from. And then the thickness is that relative abundance, right? So you can see that most of the fish that are coming through the San Juans as babies are coming out of the lower Fraser River. But we also have even some from the west side of Vancouver Island are actually coming back in um, to rear in these um, really rich shoreline habitats of the San Juans. Um, so then we also have other species of fish and we think about marine food webs, we think about salmon, what do they eat? Um, Pacific herring is a key um, food source for salmon, also for seabirds, marine mammals. Um, and they um, spawn out on the eelgrass, so very close to shore um, on eelgrass and other submerged aquatic vegetation. There's two other species of forage fish, the surf smelt and the sand lance, and they're intertidal beach spawners. So this is obviously at a low tide. The fish are coming in at a high tide, broadcast spawning, that sort of cream of wheat oatmeal looking stuff um, is a big um, deposit of smelt eggs. You can see we're up under the shade there. 
Um, so there's really, we think about kind of salmon is when we think about that classic land sea connection, right? Where the salmon are in the ocean and they're bringing the ocean nutrients, you know, up the rivers and into the forests. We also have that with other species. So these small bait fish, these small species of forage fish that are so key to marine food webs also make that land sea connection. So they're actually using our land um, to spawn on. And so they'll be on the beach for a couple of weeks, like all fish eggs, they're temperature dependent. So they're there for about a month in the winter, a couple of weeks in the summer. And then at one of those next high tides that when the fish is ready to hatch, that'll sort of trigger it and it'll go back out into the marine ecosystem um, first as in a larval phase. Um, but again, sort of that connection between our, our shorelines, um, our land and our marine ecosystem. And marine food webs are really where we think about sort of how do the salmons help support the region. So we just saw on that map of all those baby salmon that are coming from all around the region, not from the San Juans, right? There's been some work done at um, NOAA Fisheries where they're looking at growth hormones in the baby salmon. And the baby salmon that are in the shorelines of the San Juans are growing faster. And when you grow faster as a fish, that equals better long-term survival, right? It's all about getting bigger so that you can eat bigger things and also so you can avoid being eaten. Um, and then another great example of this regional connection are the marbled murrelet seabirds. I don't know if folks are familiar with them. They're an endangered seabird. It's that cute little one down there. Um, they nest in old growth forests, not in the San Juans. We don't have large swaths of old growth forests, but they're nesting um, in Olympic National Park. They're nesting on Vancouver Island. Um, and there's been some radio telemetry work where they're actually marking these um, birds and they're watching them and they're actually coming in the summers when the nesting season, they're coming, they're flying to the San Juans to catch a mouthful of fish and then they're flying back to Olympic National Park or the west coast of Vancouver Island with that mouthful of fish. Um, that's a great, I think, example, right, of how this regional um, ecosystem, that regional engine of all those shorelines in the San Juans is really reaching out. Um, there's some more recent data. Folks are, have been hearing about sort of the blob offshore. There's seabirds that are on the outer coast, so even past um, Olympic National Park, or at least on the coast part of Olympic National Park, um, that in those blob years, and that's when the water is warm and you get less mixing and you don't have all these um, smaller fish and the food web is not working as it should. Um, because in the San Juans, when you looked at that map, right, we have all these islands and there's so much current going through. It's really kind of a climate refugia because we've got forced mixing. Um, so there's really some thought and the seabirds are already in those bad years at the outer coast adjusting and moving to the San Juans. Um, and moving on from there, and of course, our Chinook salmon, so we looked at all those arrows, right? All those baby fish making their way to the Pacific Ocean. Three to four to five years later, they're coming back the other way, right? And if anyone's been to the San Juans, you know, everything has an orca whale on it. Our county logo has an orca whale on it. And that's because all of those Fraser River fish, right, that are heading, that we're heading out are now coming back. Um, and that used to be the reason that there were whales there virtually every single day all summer. Um, so that's shifting now as salmon populations are shifting. Um, obviously, the orca are going where the food is, and we're seeing them less in the San Juans, um, but they still are, are there to a certain extent. And we're hoping to recover those populations of fish. Um, so switching gears a little bit, I'm just going to talk about threats. So we think about the San Juans, and we think, oh, it's all pristine, and it's so little there. Just a reminder that we are in the midst, um, and you are all here as well, of international shipping lanes. Um, you know, Port of Vancouver is the largest port in Canada, um, also Tacoma and Seattle. Um, where we think about that with shorelines is the threat of a catastrophic oil spill, right? Like nothing could um, damage our shoreline ecology, but also our shoreline human communities as well. And then there's also um, other impacts of vessels, such as the noise and issues with um, impacts to marine mammals and their ability to communicate. Um, also, we are a huge boating destination, um, and there are a multitude of impacts um, from boats, everything from anchoring to small oil spills, um, other sewage, other sorts of pollution. This is Susha Island, if anyone's been there. That was Mother's Day a couple years ago during the pandemic. Everyone decided to go to Susha. 
<laughs> um, another threat is climate change and not just sea level rise, but changing ocean conditions. Um, we've got intertidal heat wave events. Um, we're seeing increased erosion and flood hazards. Um, again, some from sea level rise, some from increased storminess. We're getting our rain, at least in the San Juans, it's coming fast and furious, but on much less days. Um, so we're having a lot of kind of high, high flow and um, you know, mass wasting and landslide kind of events. Um, and then the one that links cl most closely probably with um, restoration that we're talking about are shoreline development. So again, I talked about there's 5,000 shoreline parcels in the San Juans. Most of those are private, residential. And so there's all these little things. And some of these pictures have some of the really old things and some of the newer things. So there's um, you know, docks, there is shoreline armoring, there's creosote pilings, there's boat ramps, um, all of the sort of things, because people like to be on the shorelines too, right? So we have this concentration of really high productivity um, from an ecological standpoint, but coasts are also where humans are gravitating, right? So we have a lot of our infrastructure there as well. And just diving into that a little more, thinking about what are we talking about when we're talking about some of these things. I will use the term armor. We do armor removals as a restoration action. Um, so I just want to get kind of get everyone on the same page about what that means. Um, for some reason, we all have to call it something different. So on the East Coast, it's seawalls. Um, the Puget Sound, it's bulkheads. Some people call it riprap. Essentially, it's a hard structure that's put on the beach or bank with the goal of limiting shoreline erosion, right? So if you're a waterfront property owner and you have either storm damage or um, from waves or um, impacts from changes to vegetation or drainage at the uplands, which is one of the primary sources of bank instability, um, people end up putting some of these structures in on the beach. Um, and in some cases, they are necessary to protect infrastructure. And in some cases, they were done as landscape features um, and that they aren't actually necessary. Um, and why we care about that is that we talked about, so again, these shoreline habitats, right, have all these biological processes happening, have all this physical, so we've got sediment supply and transport. That's what's building our beaches. Our beaches in the Pacific Northwest are coming from that sand is being maintained and coming from a little bit of erosion all the time from our bluffs and our banks. Um, and places that have armor, um, it's hotter and drier in front of there. You can sort of picture that. You can see in this picture, there's not much low tide beach left anymore. And also when you think about sea level rise and kind of resiliency, a beach naturally will move inland over time to adjust to the new sea level. Um, but there has to be a sediment supply and there has to be room to move. And when you've got a hard structure like this, you are blocking the natural sediment supply and you're also blocking the ability for the beach to move landward. Um, so before we even get to restoration, we do a fair amount of research or we rely on research that other folks have done um, to really help us decide right where is the right place to go. There's a lot of places we could go. There are a lot of things we could work on. Um, so again, shoreline armoring has been a focus because it is impacting those key coastal processes, habitats, and species. So think about those forage fish that are spawning on a beach. If there's a seawall on that beach that might be directly burying the habitat, it might be really hot and dry in front of that habitat. Um, and again, that habitat is going to have that coastal squeeze where it's not allowed to translate landward. Um, so back in 2009, we did a boat-based survey of all the armoring in San Juan County. We did that again in 2019, and we were able to really get a snapshot, right, of do a change analysis of what has changed in that 10 years out on the ground. Um, and so in this picture, all the yellow is armor that was there in 2009 and 19. The red is all the new. The blue are the places that it's been moved, removed. Excuse me. Um, and then just to summarize the results of that research, um, and it, it's pretty telling here. So despite all the sort of science about armor impacts, we have improved policies, our Shoreline Management Act, permit policies, we have restoration programs, we have technical assistance. Despite that, we are still putting way more armor in, right, than it's going out um, for real kind of process restoration region-wide, right? We want to flip that. We want to show that we're actually taking out more than is going in. 
Um, and we also, and this research, um, because we were able, we had that 10 year period, right? So we knew that all those structures were put in, in the time when you did need a permit. Um, so we also did some permit research. Um, we had a graduate student working on that um, and did you know, public records requests and comb through all the records. Um, and what we found was that 90% um, of the new structures that went in 2009 to 2019 did not have a permit prior to being constructed. Um, so a few got more got permits after being constructed. So it was about 75% didn't have permits at all. Um, and the problem with not having permits, right, is that we're not making sure that we're putting it in a place that really needs it. We don't want the landscape feature armor. Um, we also um, want there to be, make sure it's the smallest size to meet the goal that it's doing, that it's not having impacts to um, you know, natural resources or cultural resources. Um, and so in San Juan County, um, and this is, is true of, of studies that have been done in King County and other places, we really do have an issue kind of with um, managing shoreline development. Um, and that's kind of the protection side of the restoration piece, um, that regulatory protection side. Um, we also do forage fish spawn habitat research. So where are those spawning beaches? That helps us know um, where to focus our restoration. Also, it helps like in the regulatory process, right, to know where you have to either do mitigation or be really careful about your timing of your projects on beaches. Um, we're involved in a really fun project right now with um, Department of Natural Resources and Friday Harbor Marine Labs. Um, and there through University of Washington. We also, back in 2003, the same team mapped eelgrass countywide. We're using toad underwater video, um, and we are remapping last summer and this summer coming up. And then also we've been doing some snorkel surveys to collect plants and look at eelgrass wasting disease. Um, and so we don't have results yet, but we will have kind of a 20 year health assessment and trend data for the whole county with the goal, right? We're really doing applied research here because um, we want to understand where are those resilient places and where are the places that we need to focus restoration or increase protection. Um, so what do we do with all this data? Again, we're doing applied data. We're actually like looking at the questions, right, that will help us sort of move the dial, not just doing, you know, there's plenty of research projects that are really interesting, um, but ours is really with the goal of how do we actually use, you know, get actionable data that will help us um, with our marine ecosystem recovery efforts. Um, and then an important part of this, right? You can have all the science in the world, but if you don't have the humans, um, you're not gonna get a lot done. Um, and so we do do a lot of landowner engagement. We have shoreline stewardship guides um, and resources for landowners. There's a state shore friendly program. Um, Friends of the San Juans is the provider in San Juan County. We do free technical assistance. So this photo is an example. We're talking to some landowners. Their house is just to the left. It's obviously kind of a slumping um, bluff there. You can see that the previous landowners had removed all the vegetation. Um, so this is the kind of project. And I think these are some of the things that's not as sexy as restoration, right? But keeping these people from putting in a brand new big bulkhead that in 20 years or 10 years, you all, when you graduate and do restoration, are gonna have to go take out. Um, we were able to do a vegetation project here. And so this bank has been restored with um, lower vegetation, right? They've got a shoreline house there, so it's lower shrubs and things, but we're able to actually um, reduce demand for new hard armor, keep ourselves from having to always be doing restoration because we'll always be playing catch up, right? If there's new structures going in. Um, and then this is my mantra, I do this at every restoration talk, is that you can't have successful restoration if you don't have protection, because you'll never get there, right? We talked about, so I'm doing, we're gonna talk about some of the armor removals. That was a really little bit. And then all these new structures are still going in. Um, so we have not yet cracked the nut, um, and we being the, we, the big we, I would say the whole world, <laughs> um, but especially in San Juan County and, and in Puget Sound still, um, not crack the nut necessarily about regulatory protection, um, but really protecting these places. And in the San Juans, we're lucky. We have a lot of shoreline and we have a lot of it that's pretty wild and intact, right? Doing, protecting this now is, we're not that great at putting things back together, right? We know a lot, we don't know everything. Um, so protection is the most ecologically effective and it's just a lot cheaper. 
um, right, to keep something intact. So there's different tools. There's regulations, which I've talked about a bit, but there's also voluntary tools, right? We help people understand the processes. Um, we get involved in shoreline master programs and planning to make sure houses have to be set back so you don't have demand. And then there are local land trusts that are doing conservation easements, and we really have been focusing on shoreline, functional shoreline habitat, so people can actually sort of be part of the salmon recovery world um, by protecting their impact or their um, intact habitat. Okay, and here we are now at restoration. <laughs> um, so again, restoration is always, and we always joke about this, like we do restoration, the projects happen in the fall, when juvenile salmon are done migrating, that's when we can have large equipment on the beach. You know, we do this all this mapping and prioritization, and then we'll do permitting and design and working with landowners, and all of that takes years. And then, you know, in a couple of days or a couple of weeks, we'll actually implement the restoration project. But so that actual, like the doing the restoration part of it is like the smallest part. Um, but I'm just gonna talk about some different or show some pictures of some different kinds of restoration. Mostly what we've been focused on right now is sort of building demonstration projects, building support for these, it's kind of the low hanging fruit. And I'll talk about some of the larger, more complex projects too. Um, but again, there's unnecessary rock on this beach, blocking um, the salt marsh and the channel. And um, this is a private residential site. Um, that's a much nicer beach for humans as well as for fish. Um, this is another one that we just completed in fall of 2023. And um, there was this big um, seawall bulkhead with fill behind it. And then we took out, I um, can't remember exactly how many it was, something like 100 dump truck loads of fill from behind this and unburied this, what now looks like a beautiful beach. So all that wood has come back in. Um, that is basically, they built that new little greenhouse thing. So it's harder to see, but that little white building. Um, is the same in both of those photos. So unburied that beach. Um, we definitely have had folks say like, how could you take that out? That property always floods because it's so low. Um, and I don't have a picture here, which I should have put in, but, but water bulkheads don't stop flooding. They stop erosion from the upland, right? They are holding that land back. Water just goes through, around, over. Um, so this project, property flooded before, and it's actually flooding less afterwards because this more porous beach that now, and you can see a little bit, we've replanted um, dune grass and also kind of a berm of shrubs along the back. So they've actually had less flooding this winter than they normally have. Um, this was a project with state parks, and I will say at Friends of the San Juans, we don't own any property. We work collaboratively with folks. Um, so we work with tribes, we work with the county, we work with state parks, and we work mostly with private landowners. Um, but this was an opportunity to move a road, take out a small perch culvert that was brought blocking fish passage. Um, this is kind of during restoration, but I did want to show this is like right when the water started to go through here again after being blocked for 100 years. That was pretty fun. Um, and that project, again, it's a sea level rise adaptation. We removed the road. We removed all that hard armor and that barrier to translation. Um, but parks still needed a road, right? So instead of having it take up 300 feet of the salt marsh, there's a little connector road now um, through the woods about 500 yards inland of the salt marsh. Um, and then that's the same site from a different direction, um, just showing kind of where that old road was. It was a state parks road, right? It wasn't like a big highway that we took out, but there was a lot of fill. So we took down the elevation, restored that whole tide channel, and then all the hard armor has been removed. Um, other kinds of projects, and we don't think of them necessarily as restoration, but we do have a big green boating program. We talked about all the boating that happens. So this is, um, you're looking at the milt or kind of a whitewater event that they call for herring, Pacific herring spawning. Um, that's happening right now. If you see anything like that when you're at the coast, take a picture, um, send it to one of the either Department of Fish and Wildlife or me and we'll pass it along. Um, so, but we do a lot of work with boaters, educating them about where the eelgrass is, where are the safe places to anchor, where are the places to avoid um, so that you're not pulling up eelgrass. And you think like, oh, it's just that one little clump, right? But if you think about all year round, like that same bay, you leave as a boater and then the next boater comes and they put their anchor down and they set. And so that repetitive cumulative impact. Um, and then there's also boating facilities, right? People have anchor or, um, mooring buoys and docks and overwater structures and all the kinds of things that we do with boating. 
So those are restoration actions. Um, and then this is a project, um, Tulalip Tribes actually owns a parcel on Lopez. This was an old overwater structure dock. So it's toxic creosote treated wood. Um, it's shading overwater structure, right? It's shading the eelgrass. Eelgrass is a flowering plant. It needs light to grow. Um, so that was able to be fully removed. Um, and then this is on my home island. This is on Orcas. This is Crescent Beach for people who have been there. Um, Anwen knows this quite well. So this site is, um, so it's Pacific herring spawning offshore. The beach is also a um, sand lance spawning beach. There's wetland on one side. Um, and you can see at high tide <laughs> events, um, at king tide events with a storm, right? So it's not just sea level rise, right? Sea level rise, even if it's only a couple inches, that couple inches makes a difference when you have a south wind occurring and a storm with the wet maximum winds occurring at the high tide, right? And then you get all these impacts. But we're gonna be dealing with all around um, our low lying roads and we're gonna deal with them because we want access um, and safe access and we don't wanna sort of keep throwing our road maintenance money um, at these sites that are gonna be continually damaged. So these projects are hard, but this is also a huge restoration opportunity when you think about, there's like eight miles of roads like this in the San Juans. You would have to work with 400 landowners, right? To get to eight miles. Um, and there's only one landowner, but these are complicated and controversial projects, right? Because people get very used to and very comfortable with sort of the way things have been and where the roads are. So it's not easy, um, but there are significant opportunities with these um, and really help us scale up these projects to think about them as sort of a multi-benefit. Um, it's complicated from a funding point of view, right? Like, so if you get funded for restoration, you can't pay for the road part and road money can't be paid for anything else. And so it is gonna require some creative thinking, um, but there are some significant restoration opportunities. Um, so in summary, these are kind of my themes, right, is you can't have successful restoration without protection. Um, you're just not going to get net gain, right? You're just going to be holding the line or even still following back. Um, sea level rise is a significant threat, right? And it is creating more demand for new hard armor, especially at the individual property owner scale and also, frankly, at the county road scale. But there is a significant opportunity there if we can be creative enough to make that work. Um, of course, you need the science, right? We need to know where to focus these efforts. We're not just going out everywhere and removing these little structures. We're thinking about where are the places where the house isn't at risk, where there are forage fish spawning at this site, where it's a priority area for juvenile salmon that are coming through, um, where our, our efforts, right, are gonna have the most impact. And then the big thing is we really do need to think about how we scale up these projects. Infrastructure projects is one example. Um, Big infusions of more money is another example. More people entering this field, right? We're a little NGO doing this. There's not many groups in the San Juans doing restoration. We didn't used to do restoration. We're a land use group, right? We were doing policy and we were thinking about land use. Um, and then we started doing all the shoreline science really to inform our policy conversations because there was just a lot of, you know, we'd say, oh, you can't do that because there's impacts. And then people would say, oh, there's not impacts, but nobody had any data, right? So we filled all those data gaps. And then once you start looking at the data and you're using GIS and you're looking at, wow, look at these places that have that totally unnecessary failing structure and all these priority resources. Um, and then so then our organization made a conscious effort to get into the restoration game. Um, and as I alluded to before, um, there's no way to do this without a whole suite of people. And so, and certainly it's not just me, right? So there's the whole team of the staff and board and members of friends, um, all of our collaborators and our funders and our partners. And there's many more than this. This is sort of the universe as it exists right now um, at our organization. Um, but I do just wanna sort of shout out to all these other people. There's groups like Northwest Straits Foundation is based right here in Bellingham. Um, also Coastal Geologic Services who does our restoration designs. They're also based right here in Bellingham. Um, so there's a lot of folks actually that come right through the Western system and then end up doing a lot of this work throughout the region. And with that, I think we'll stop and do questions. Thank you. I know that worked out luckily. Go ahead. Was there a lack of political will to challenge
enforcement. And when they do enforcement, should they take uh, well, I used to do enforcement for the state department of qualities. I recognize you. <laughs> <laughs> so look at the look at the approach of the contractor and the landowner who said well, you're both guilty. You should be fighting amongst yourself who's gonna pay to make it out. So which what the what's the county doing? Yeah, so repeating the question is, is um, you know, is the lack of enforcement a lack of political will or something else, kind of what's going on in San Juan County? Um, well, right now in San Juan County, we have no code enforcement officer, an interim planning director, and no um, hiring for a county manager. So we, and a couple of those positions have been open for about a year. So it's particularly bad, um, but in general, Yes, there is not a lot of political will. Um, and also most of the enforcement happens right on a sort of um, complaint driven only system. Um, and then some of these projects become so complex that unfortunately in some cases people sort of destabilize their sites so much in the process of doing something that it's not so easy to just say, oh, go take that out, right? And then the long permit process. I will say that there are a few um, of the unpermitted structures where there's, um, and it's being led more by the federal and state agencies, kind of bringing the county along with them. When we see the agencies working together and kind of coming in on enforcement, there are a few that are slated to come out. Um, I do, again, I refer to, I grew up on an island on the East Coast. They were very strict. You build an illegal guest house for $100,000, you pay $50,000 to take that thing apart and haul it away. Just a few of those would sort of spread the word. Um, but there has been, I would say, a lack of political will. Other questions? Go ahead. I'm uh, wondering if landowners, when you go to a landowner um, that needs a, that, um, or the bulkhead needs to be reused, are they, um, is it a voluntary thing for them to remove it, or do you need a policy mechanism to tell them to remove it? Yeah, great question. So the question is, when we're doing restoration and removing armor, um, are is that sort of voluntary on the part of the landowner, or are they being compelled? So in the case that we were just talking about, um, where there is unpermitted or unauthorized armor, and Friends doesn't do this, we're not the compliance agency, but the state agencies or the county may compel someone to actually remove it. What we do is only work with folks on a voluntary basis. And so when I talked about the shoreline technical assistance we provide, we do workshops, we'll actually come out with a coastal engineering geologist and have folks look at people's site, kind of talk about um, not, it's not feasible to remove armor everywhere, right? Some houses are really close. Um, you know, some places are really unstable. Um, but again, there are a lot of places where it was put in as a landscape feature or the house is really far set back or there, you know, it's not an issue. Um, and with that, it really is sort of a journey and where we're really connecting the dots with the science of where it's important, but also the landowner willingness, right? And so every project site that's a great project site isn't going to happen. Some of them not because of you know because of landowner willingness. Um, but yeah, we've had a we have had a a lot of folks willing to kind of you know go there. Um, and again, we pick good sites, right? We're we're picking sites carefully so that we're not jeopardizing people's people's structures. Go ahead. Yeah, so that question was um, how do for in these voluntary cases when we're doing a removal, how do we pay for it? So there, because salmon are listed under the Endangered Species Act and our orca are eating the salmon, right? And then we're sort of going back down the food chain to what can we do to help these species? There are federal funds, state funds, um, and then there are many groups like Friends of the San Juans that will help. So when we have an interested landowner, um, We've got funding through that state shore friendly program where we can do some of the early feasibility and design to figure out if something actually is a good project technically. 
Um, and then there are competitive grant programs. And so we'll help landowners all along the way. Folks do contribute something like the landowners. Sometimes they'll pay for the archeology span report or they'll do in-kind work. Um, but the vast majority of the costs for the whole project are usually covered with grant funds. So there's a couple that came in. Oh, yeah. Building. Okay. Yeah, so the question is if we've had um, resistance from commercial shellfish companies. Um, we are fortunate in the San Juans that we have a very small number of commercial shellfish companies. It's not sort of the big business that it is other places in Puget Sound. Um, and so we haven't, um, and the one I can think of, West Cafe Shellfish Farms, is like putting our green boating information there. And, um, and we've actually talked to them about taking out, they've got like this weird section of rock um, on the shoreline, but it's in a really remote place. So it's like, sort of, you have to weigh the cost benefits of some of these things. Um, so we have not had um, any issues with shellfish farmers, but we have not also, we did one project with a um, shellfish farm. There was an old kind of degraded tide gate. Um, and so that was a positive relationship with a shellfish farm. Um, I think you were wondering too, if your website, you guys publish any reports from your restoration projects to the website? Yeah, so if you go to our website and go up kind of under our work, so if you go to Shoreline Property Owners, that's all the technical assistance programs, and then you'll see a category for Shoreline Restoration. That has the entire suite of probably 15 projects that we've done over the last 10 years, pre-post photos, there's videos with landowners, there's more details, um, and then there's also like a research and maps page that really needs to be updated, but it is just a big messy list, but there's all kinds of the eelgrass data and forage fish maps and the sea level rise vulnerability work and um, all that data is there. And please do, if you're interested in a particular topic, just shoot me an email and I'm happy to kind of point you in the right direction. Back to the room. All right, back to the room, Xander. Or not Xander, sorry. <laughs> How do you do that without Yeah, it is an issue. Um, so we have worked, the part that friends did was really the mapping of where those piles were, the ones that weren't already associated with like a dock that was being used for something, um, and also prioritizing in terms of eelgrass and you know priority species. And then we partnered with the Washington Department of Natural Resources. They actually handle the contract um, for getting those out, but there are best management practices. So there definitely is like a little bit of a, you know, when you're doing the disturbance, but those on hot summer days, you know, anyway, are already leaching all the time. Um, and then there are some protocols sort of for, you know, how much vibrating you do and where you cut them off below the sediment and things like that to try to minimize that. Um, but really in the grand scheme of things, there's, you know, a hundred carcinogens in those. So just getting that stuff out of the water. Uh, if we wanted to get involved with Friends of the San Juans, how would we join? Or is there uh, volunteer work? Are there job openings? That sort of thing. Yeah, great question. So um, also on our website, there is a place to kind of express interest in volunteer work. Um, and then we periodically um, do more formal um, internships um, with folks. Um, like I referenced with that Armour research, we had a graduate student working with us on that. Um, so that is, th that'll also be on our website, um, but there are lots of opportunities to volunteer. And actually I was just telling Ginny, my, when I first moved to Orcas, um, I was still doing work for the Oregon Watershed Council that I was working for kind of contract work, but I was volunteering at Friends doing the forage fish surveys. Um, so I have the inside scoop on the job coming open. if people are willing to cooperate once they realize that they're interrupting um, or interfering with the salmon or whatever, you know, what what percentage of people are say, okay, yes, let's go forward with with the plan of removing the armor. Yep. Um, so this question is about, you know, what percentage of folks are interested in, you know, once they learn more about pursuing armor removal. So I don't know that we necessarily know the answer to that question yet. We um, 
haven't reached everyone. And because it is a voluntary program, we sort of do, we do a lot of outreach, um, you know, offering people workshops. We do community neighbor beach walks. We do those individual site visits where we'll bring an engineering geologist out. And it really is kind of that sort of the start of the relationship. Um, and it can be a long time. Um, you know, we're doing a project that I'm permitting right now coming out in the fall. 10 years ago, that landowner was not at all interested in doing it and she's kind of come around um, and now we're doing that project. Um, so, you know, I, I wish that there was enough capacity that we had like really had a good conversation with everyone and we knew the answer to that, but I don't think we really do. It is of course just a subset and that's again why this protection side, helping people understand, you know, that you don't always need, armoring does not solve every problem and unfortunately, armoring that you design yourself and put in without a permit can sometimes make things way worse. I will just say that too as a caution. Go ahead. You brought in sort of part of the experts in this room, but um, like, it feels like 90% of people like, don't know that you're doing armoring. Like, is it a part of There are. Um, so there are, you can do, oh, sorry, repeating the question. So are, I always forget to do that. Um, I was doing good there. Um, are there, so talking about the 90% that where people put in armor without a permit first, what are the, you know, tools that we can use to minimize that, right? So one is really good enforcement. And again, I think if they're just a couple times, like people had to really sort of like bite the bullet and take it out, word would get out. Um, some counties have very strong fines that go to the contractor. So we get a lot of sort of the landowner and the contractor sort of pointing fingers at each other in these situations, right? Like, oh, I didn't know. Um, and then also because compliance, nobody's looking. Compliance and in the San Juans, right? Like you don't all just like drive by everybody's house on your way to school. Um, and so lots of things happen unless somebody sees something and actually complains. Um, so part of it, we're kind of coming at it for both ways, right? At Friends, we're really working, we're kind of working through that list and prioritizing those sites and really pushing for the state and the county to do better compliance. We're also doing the carrot of, we will come out and give you a free technical, you know, engineering geologist point of view. And, and again, I talked about earlier, lots of this unstable bluffs is caused by vegetation removal and upland drainage issues all the impervious surface people are putting in, roofs, houses, driveways. People have this habit of mowing right to the very edge of the bluff and then they're wondering why the bluff is unstable because the poor like two trees that are on the vertical face, right, are all that's left. Um, so it's sort of the, the both, um, and I think that's, again, I alluded to this in the beginning, this is why Friends is a really great fit for me is that we do the hard policy work, right? Those are hard conversations to have. Not everyone wants to talk about compliance. We're also doing the sort of, let us help you um, so that you can avoid needing this very expensive, very time consuming structure, right? There are some easy things you can do like planting vegetation, controlling your drainage um, that can really help shorelines. Um, and you'll have a, a nicer, more pleasant beach, right? If you look at those pictures, like where there's that big wall, that woman hadn't been on that beach in 20 years, right? Now she goes there every single day. Um, so one more minute, if you want to okay. do one Zoom question. One more Zoom question. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. These are great questions. Yeah, so I have not been as involved directly. So that has been um, through our San Juan Islands Conservation District and through um, University of Washington. Um, I know that the first phase where they were actually planting out eelgrass plants and shoots was not as successful and they are switching to really um, expanding and doing more of planting eelgrass seeds. Um, and there, that does look like, I guess that there's some, some research from around the world, frankly, um, that is showing that that's more successful. And I think they're really right now just scaling that up in the same ones. I don't think we really have a lot of results yet because I think they're really just in the process of of doing that on a more a broader scale than just like just a few research sites. Right. So, but yeah, I am not the not the right person for that question. <laughs> Let's get one more round of applause to All right, thank you. Thank you. We'll see you all next week.